from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Nicholas Brown and I work with the Office of Special Events and Public Programs. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the historic Coolidge Auditorium. Today we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month at the Library of Congress and we are very pleased to be joining hands with Discovery in Espanol and Verizon Fios for today's events. These events are presented in conjunction with the library's semi-annual main reading room open house which takes place several times throughout the year. You can visit our website for more information about that, loc.gov. Today's events have included a Frida Kahlo story time and children's activities, tours of the Explore the Early Americas exhibit, and also treasures displays relating to Benito Juarez and National Hispanic Heritage Month. The library's Hispanic collections are curated by the Hispanic Division, whose chief is Georgette Dorn. This afternoon's film screening and interview will kick off shortly. We're gonna present Discovery in Espanol's docudrama, Benito Juarez, La Derrota de un Imperio. It is a 45 minute television docudrama special directed by Carlos Polado. The film is presented in Spanish. Immediately following the film, we will have an interview on the legacy of Benito Juarez and covering the film as well. On the panel will be Michaela Giorelli, who is the Vice President of Production and Development at Discovery Communications, Barbara Tenenbaum, a retired Hispanic specialist at the Library of Congress's Hispanic Division, and the moderator will be Talia Guzman Gonzalez, who is a reference librarian and Luso-Brazilian specialist in the Library's Hispanic Division. The interview will be presented in English. Throughout the event, and as you go home and ponder the film, we invite you to join us on social media with the hashtag LCHispanic. I'd also like to draw your attention to some of the upcoming Hispanic Heritage Month events, which are listed in your program. On Wednesday, October 11th at 3 o'clock p.m., we have a lecture with Claudia Isabel Navas, who is an art historian on Francisco de Miranda and the United States. On Thursday, October 12th, we have a lecture with Chrissy Arce from the University of Miami on Mexico's Nobodies, the Cultural Legacy of the Soldadera and Afro-Mexican Women. Finally, on Friday evening at 7 p.m. in the Pickford Theater, we will be screening Selena. All of these events are free and open to the public. Tickets are available. Visit us at loc.gov for more information. I'd also like to draw your attention to a new Hispanic-themed podcast series that the Library's Hispanic Division has recently launched in the last week in conjunction with National Hispanic Heritage Month. It is fabulous and it's a great insight into recording archives of Hispanic literature and culture as well as the physical archives here at the library. Without further ado, uh, thank you for being here and thanks to Discovery and Maritza, of course, in particular for working with us and to Verizon Fios for supporting this program and we look forward to seeing you at the end of the event. Thanks. Um, so I have a couple of questions prepared for Barbara Tenenbaum and Michaela. Um, and please feel free to, at any point, if you want to ask a question or would like them to um, develop anything further to just, you know, jump in. There might be a microphone somewhere around here. If not, just raise your hand. And I think we're close enough that we can, that we can hear you. Um, Thank you so much for allowing us to show this documentary here. Um, I would, the movie begins in media rest, right? So we're already, the conflict already started. Um, and later on, one of the speakers mentions that Benito Juarez was a democratically elected president. Can you, Barbara and Miquel also as well, tell us a little bit more about Benito Juarez and his rise to presidency. How did he get there? I know it's a big question, but you know, yes, maybe some of <laughs> the background and context for it's, for it, it's an amazing story and um, uh, one that Mexicans cherish very much. Um, Benito Juarez was uh, from the state of Oaxaca in the south, which is an indigenous state. He was Apotec Indian, both sides. Um, 
although interestingly enough, the Mexicans don't consider him to be an Indian uh, because culturally he was not. Um, at the age of three, he was an orphan. He lost both his parents. And um, he basically um, walked from his little village to uh, the city of Oaxaca and apprenticed himself to a lawyer. And he ultimately became a lawyer. The mythology says that he married the lawyer's daughter, but uh, that's under dispute at the moment. But he certainly married Margarita. And um, he went on from there. He became governor of the state of Oaxaca. And um, he was an avowed opponent of Antonio Lopez de Santana, who you probably have heard of. And uh, Santana exiled him. And uh, he was in the United States in New Orleans, where he was a reader in a tobacco factory. They were, um, tobacco factories in those days had, uh, while the people were making the cigars, uh, they would have a reader read to them from books or the newspaper or whatever. And he uh, performed that function. As soon as uh, the revolution of Ayutla in 1854 was declared, Juarez and a lot of other Mexican exiles left the US and went back to Mexico. Uh, Santana resigned from the presidency the following year in 1855, and Juarez became the minister of justice in the cabinet. And he is responsible for a law called the Ley Juarez in which the church and the army lose their special privileges, um, which was uh, one of the first blows struck against the church in that period. Mm -hmm. Then um, various, well, uh, the head of the government, uh, Juan Alvarez, resigned in favor of Ignacio Comonfort, so everybody changed a little bit their positions. And ultimately, Juarez became the head of Gobernación, and then acceded to the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, but Mexico would go through a horrible period from 1858, when it was t the government was taken over by conservatives, until 1867, which you saw in the film, um, when they throw out the French. And from that point on, except for a very small interlude during the revolution, the conservatives never, ever take power again in Mexico or at least not by name. <laughs> and you can, you can make your own judgments about that. <laughs> Benito Juarez died in 1872. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, when you go to, I'm not gonna say if, when you go to Mexico City, you will see Avenida Juarez. And in Avenida Juarez, there is what is called the Hemiciclo, which is dedicated to Benito Juarez. This was put together by his successor, Porfirio Diaz, who was also from Oaxaca. Would you like to add anything to that, Michaela? Yes, I mean, what I, what I want to add is that um, discovering Espanol, uh, we are um, always looking for subjects that are relevant to our Hispanic audience. And uh, uh, 2017 marks the 150 year anniversary of the restoration of the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, and we always have wanted to do something about Benito Juarez because it's like a national hero, a national mm -hmm. icon in Mexico. He uh, has become a symbol of Mexican nationalism and uh, also a symbol of um, a resistance to foreign intervention. And he um, is also like, you were mentioning is considered one of the propeller for uh, the liberal reform changes that took place in the 19th century. So it's still very relevant in um, histor I mean, in, in present days. And he's the only president that has a public holiday. Uh, his birthday is a public holiday in Mexico, March 21st. And, uh, but also what I think, I think Mexicans love a lot about him is that um, he fought for equalitarian rights. Obviously, he had to uh, fight against a lot of prejudice to become the leader of the country, being a Native American himself. But, but there, are, there were so many fascinating things about this character. That's why we wanted to tell a story. I and mean, I think we found the right angle with this historical anniversary. Yeah, that was a question I had because you know, of all of the events that you could have chosen to 
you know, address in a movie about Benito Juarez. You chose this, these years, these very particular years yes. for the docudrama. Would yeah, you like for, uh, the, one of the reasons why we chose this, looking at all his life, is was because we thought it was a very, it's not a, that well known, um, like Batalla de Puebla and other uh, things that just came a couple of years before. But it's a very decisive moment for, for Mexican history and the, it's the end of foreign intervention. And it's like, it's a second, um, it's like a second struggle for independence, almost a, a second defeat of European powers. So it's, it's a very significant, and I think it's a beautiful story, this republic itinerant for four years. And so I think that's why we chose this, um, this, this story. Of mm -hmm. And I want to congratulate you for the lovely film that you made. Thank you. It's, yeah. uh, it's a really, it's an important story for the Hispanic public to see, and also for the non-Hispanic public to see. Definitely. Um, and you did a beautiful job. Thank you yeah. very much. You even gave Maximilian red hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was- That was difficult. <laughs> I was so shocked because I said to myself, they're not gonna do that. <laughs> and there it was. I, one of the images that really captured my mind as a, as a librarian and as an archivists want to be probably, is that the film opens up with the, with the archive and it closes with the archive as well. And it, 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 it's, it's an important, it plays an important role yeah. throughout um, the movie. So I would like you both to address the archive as a narrative choice. Why yeah. did you choose this to be? So well, for important? us, it's like a late motif mm -hmm. of the film. Um, he, he sees himself as like probably the guardian of the nation is a way of defending the nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting, we, obviously, for budget reason, we couldn't visualize that, but he, he left with 11 wagons mm -hmm. of documents, among them the, the Declaration of Independence. Um, so we just thought it was a beautiful way of, uh, you know, showing his, his, um, his patriotism for, for Mexico. Well, he should be the patron saint of historians, at least for Mexican historians, <laughs> because uh, I, I can hardly think of any uh, dissertation or book that could have been written about Mexican history without the archive. Mm -hmm. And so we are incredibly indebted, and the archive has moved in many, many ways uh, many places in Mexico City. In fact, it's, a, it's now housed in a prison, uh, Le Cumberi, and it's sinking. So there's going to have to be another rescue. Um, but I don't think we're going to have to take the archive to Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope not. You know, I, I had to laugh because, of course, uh, Benito Juarez had to go to Chihuahua and then Paso del Norte. But uh, the thing that's so funny about it is to somebody from the south and even from the center to go to Chihuahua. I mean, it's like, you know, Desert. you can't possibly imagine what, uh, what that means. And, and, and Chihuahua is, is uh, there's a lot of desert there. And um, it's not exactly considered to, I mean, when you say I Chihuahua, <laughs> I mean, that gives you a sense of how they feel about it. And, and I love the part in the movie where it shows US on this side and Mexico on the other side because uh, if he had set foot in the US, that would have been the end. And he knew it very well. And, and, and the movie conveys that extraordinarily um, that he couldn't get any further north. Now, of course, he could have. He could have gone to the west and going to Baja California. But luckily, he never had to do that. Um, but then how would he have gotten? I'm trying to think. Yeah, he would have had to cross into the United States in order to get the archive. So luckily, uh, the Prussians stirred up trouble just at the right moment. How is the research process for a documentary like this uh, made? In Yes, once we define the topic, we, we hire a historical consultant, mm -hmm. and um, in this case, it was someone from the uh, Colegio de Mexico. Uh, and then Erica. we, yeah, mm -hmm. correct. And then we, 
we do pre-interviews with all the experts, uh, different specialties, some, some people from the uh, specialty of the Second Empire, we had there a military historian, mm -hmm. Camposano. So the different disciplines, and we do pre-interview with all of them. Uh, once we have the pre-interview, we write a script, then we do the official interview, we recorded the interview, with the uh, official already recorded interview, we do the recreation so we know exactly, we have already chosen sort of with moments we want to visualize. And uh, after that, we, we have a, again an, the consultant reviewing that everything is fine. And even during the recreation, obviously for all the costumes, the location, we have, uh, we have this expert involved in the project. And then, um, you know, during the post-production is still involved, but it's, uh, it's a process that takes uh, three to six months, mm -hmm. the pre-production. Can you talk a little bit about the effectiveness of a docu docudrama uh, versus a more traditional documentary? Yeah, I mean, I, I love traditional documentary, mm -hmm. but I do see an advantage of doing a docudrama for the viewers. Um, it's, a, it's a very engaging way of telling a story, and also I think you can humanize your character better. So, I mean, in, in the case of Benito Juarez, many people have seen a picture of him, the phot photograph that we see here, and there's a lot of statue, but in this case, we really wanted to show him as the uh, man of the family and a father and a husband, and you could only have done it through, you know, through dramatization. Mm. And um, I think it's a very engaging way of telling the story. Um, you, you take some freedom sometimes, but that makes it more accessible for our viewers, and uh, we love to make history accessible and, and entertaining to all the to our viewers. Barbara, you have studied uh, extensively the relationship between the US and Mexico. And we see that the US plays an important role even uh -huh. in this, in this, uh, during this intervention. Could you elaborate a little bit on? Well, I would like to be able to say that this was the last intervention into Mexico. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> the United States intervened twice mm -hmm. in the 20th century in Mexico. Um, uh, once uh, to, uh, be, it, it, it's a very confusing story that needs to be really written more extensively. Once in Veracruz, where we were there for probably almost a year, and the other was when, when Pancho Villa oh, went into yeah, Columbus, New Columbus. Mexico. Yes, went yeah. into Columbus, New Mexico and shot up the town and killed some people. And so General Pershing went with uh, General Patton as his aide-de-camp into, into Mexico, which was a, a dress rehearsal for World War I, for the U.S. intervention into World War I. On the other hand, to put in a note, a positive note for a change about the United States and Mexico, if it hadn't been for Woodrow Wilson, uh, Lord knows what have, would have happened to Mexico, because Woodrow Wilson refused to accept Huerta, who was a conservative, as president because he had, he had uh, gotten the presidency through assassination. And uh, thanks to his refusal to recognize Huerta, Huerta fell. And so Mexico became a democratic state again. Uh, and it's really quite remarkable. Mexico's a very remarkable place. Uh, for example, and this is something that people don't make enough hay about as far as I'm concerned, in 1920, excuse me, in 1829, President Vicente Guerrero uh, abolished slavery in Mexico. Now you can see there's a big difference between 1829 and 1865 when the United States did it. Um, now for sure, there were a lot fewer slaves in Mexico, but still, it was, it, it's the concept. And if you think about it hard, you'll realize that it cost Mexico ultimately 55% of its territory because the Texans were not going to accept a, a non-slave republic. Um, and so they, they uh, won their freedom in 1836. Now, so the relationship between the United States, you know, Porfirio Diaz famously said, poor Mexico, so close to the United States and so far from God. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he had a point. Um, but on the other hand, Mexico had 
as did the United States, some superb leaders. And in this particular case, they came, they were at the same time. So you had Lincoln in the United States and Juarez in Mexico. And both of them saved the nationality of their respective republics. And uh, that was wonderful. Now, the fact that the United States, uh, you see it in the film, President Johnson says, America for the Americans, what he meant was um, the South of the United States for the United States. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, but he did help in important ways to save Mexican sovereignty, and that was a very big and wonderful thing. So, uh, Did Benito Juarez ever visit the United States as president of Mexico? Well, I mean, he was there during his exile, mm -hmm. but he wasn't president at the time. Mm -hmm. No, he did not. Not as president. The United mm -hmm. States as president, mm -hmm. no. No, and he never met with, with uh, President Lincoln, although a lot of people think he did. Um, I have two more questions, but I want to see if someone else has uh, questions for um, our specialist and our executive producer from the audience. While you're thinking of questions, let, Don't me, be shy. <laughs> let me tell you about Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> uh, many, many people. We did a, by the way, we did a documentary, also a docudrama about Cinco de Mayo. Oh, I oh you're producing it. it? Oh, I want to yes. see it. Excellent. Cinco de, <laughs> now, uh, many of you, or maybe none of you, think that Cinco de Mayo was Mexican Independence Day. It is not. Um, Cinco de Mayo um, represents a battle that took place in 1862 between the Mexicans and the French. And in this particular case, Ignacio Zaragoza, who was head of the Mexican army, and by the way, born in Texas, uh, defeated the French. It was one of those few cases in which a Latin American power defeated a European power. And that is why it is celebrated in California and in the United States. Usually it's an opportunity for us to have tacos and beer, um, neither of which is a bad thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it, it commemorates something very, very serious and important. In Mexico, of course, they don't commemorate. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us something about that documentary that you're thinking that no, you're we did producing? It, or? Uh, yeah, we did it for the 150 year anniversary mm -hmm. of Batalla de Puebla. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used a very similar, we, we sort of took a couple of uh, the military from both from the French side of the, and the Mexican side to humanize the story. Mm -hmm. And then we, it was a co-production with the, with the um, state of Puebla. So mm. we had uh, 200 army at our disposal for, for the scenes. It was, it was a military, it was more of a battle. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was every single uh, uh, different moment of the battle were visualized. So it was a different documentary and in this one, it covered less, uh, less time, but uh, it was very effective uh, and they, it did very well with our audience. Excellent. Um, how, do you, how does this coverage choose their topics for for the documentaries and for the documentary or for uh, these docudramas, yeah. documentaries. Well, generally we look at anniversaries because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's always good to be talking about something that is relevant with the present, and uh, we try to um, uh, to f to find sort of meaningful, uh, you know, anniversary for our Hispanic audience. Mm -hmm. um, we have done two specials already in Pancho Villa, one about the attack of Columbus that you were just mentioning before. It was, it was done last year. We did something about the conspiracy of the assassination of Pancho Villa also. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, we did the Batalla de Puebla, we did something about the independence uh, for the 200 year anniversary of the independence of Mexico. And um, we did, that was a little bit more difficult. We did the biography on Porfirio Diaz. It was more oh, difficult oh, because it's a oh. very controversial figure in Mexico. Oh, yes. And so we, we had to really balance the story. And um, uh, we started from the present because there is a movement in Mexico that would like his body to be returned to, the, to Mexico because he's buried in, in Paris. In, in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. Yes. yes. So um, 
so we look for fascinating story, relevant, and they, they have been working very well, especially with our Mexican and Hispanic audience here mm -hmm. in the US. Uh, and uh, I particularly love to do them. <laughs> I learn a lot. Is there a, is there a docudrama that you would like to produce that you're thinking, this is a moment we need to? Well, there is a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I have a long list. <laughs> I would love to do this history of Maximiliano and Carlotta from their perspective oh. about this moment of history. I think mm -hmm. that's fascinating, too. Uh, something about the Mexican-American wars would be interesting, too. We had never done something specifically about the revolution of Mexico. Um, so there's a lot of countless <laughs> stories for the revolution, that's for sure. Yeah. There are many stories yeah. to tell. Can I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to make a note here about two um, uh, effects of the French intervention uh, that were permanent. One, one of them is, is that um, the term Latin America mm. comes from Napoleon III. Mm. It is an imperialist term. So if you call yourself Latino or Latina, you should think about it because uh, that, uh, Napoleon said, well, after all, um, the Western Hemisphere is mostly Catholic and Romance language speaking. So therefore, it's Latin American. Mm. Wow. The other thing it, is really quite funny. Um, when you think of Mexico, there are several things that come to mind. Tequila, for example. Um, but also what comes to mind are mariachi. And the mariachi, it's a, it, it, there's a lot of dispute, but there is a school of thought that says that mariachi came from marriages that were performed during the empire. And the French word mariage became mariachi. Mm -hmm. So that, and that has stuck. Mm -hmm. So when you see a, a guy playing an instrument who's got silver up, up his leg, uh, remember that that might have come from a French wedding somewhere in Mexico. <laughs> it's interesting. Story. I didn't know that. <laughs> Maybe a story of the mariachis. Yes. <laughs> Before we go, uh, Barbara, why don't you tell our audience of the marvelous, you were the Mexican specialist for many years at the library and our holdings have you know, so many treasures. Uh, would you like to tell them a little bit of our collection oh, in well, the library? <laughs> I mean, our collection in the library. The wonderful thing about the Library of Congress is that uh, it's, it's a vehicle for surprise. You say to yourself, oh, they can't have something on that. And you look it up, and yes, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite of those is when I was, we had to do something about, oh yeah, we had to do something about the Kislak and, and um, the Spanish versus the indigenous. And I said, ah, they don't have anything on the Santiago de Compostela, the, the pilgrimage route. That, that people are still taking, they mm -hmm. call it El Camino. And lo and behold, in our, our rare book division, there's a piece of parchment that says, you have, um, because you have walked the uh, pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela, you will receive the following indulgences. And it's dated from the 13th century. Wow. I mean, it, you know, it, it's just amazing the stuff that, that uh, you could find in, in the Library of Congress. Um, from Mexico, uh, we have a book, for example, that was a legal case that the founder of La Paz, Baja California, uh, his wife was trying to get a noble title, and there's a frontispiece that's in four colors and gold leaf, uh, dating from the 17th century. I, you know, we, it, the amount of materials that we, we have, for example, uh, a poem by Pablo Neruda that was written on shirt, uh, the remnants of the linen from shirts during the Spanish Civil War mm -hmm. because they didn't have paper so they had to use this linen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's just absolutely amazing what the Library of Congress has. And we have a gift in the reading room Come see the Hispanic reading yes, room. We're we have a picture of Benito Juarez. In we room. have a picture of Benito Juarez that was mm -hmm. given to us by President Echeverria in the 70s. 
We have the only murals in the Library of Congress mm -hmm. that were done by a Brazilian artist, Candida mm -hmm. Portinari. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, of course, I don't say this in front of her, but um, that's because Nelson Rockefeller was paying, yeah. and he wasn't going to let Diego Rivera, God forbid, paint <laughs> the murals. And of course, if Diego Rivera had painted the murals, we would have lines around the block waiting to see. <laughs> Oh, Where is come on. We won. We won. <laughs> the Candida Portina murals are absolutely fantastic. And Micaela, you should come and see them definitely. And, oh, I will. And the sure. portrait by uh, Benito Juarez. It's wonderful because people walk in. I have a, qu a question for you. <laughs> do you. Do you know if it's true that Benito Mussolini was named after Benito Juarez? Have you ever heard this story? No. Because I don't think parents, that's true. His parents were socialists and. But I don't know, it's just that I heard this story. I, well, I'm going to ask the Italian know. specialist. OK, thank you. Is this something curious. you've heard then? That I've never Benito. heard it. I heard these rumors, and I, I was just curious. Hmm. You know, I, I doubt it, but I, I will check on it for you. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting. You have to give me, did you give me your card? I, have I to will, give you card. I will. Yeah. Do we have any questions from others? Oh, one all the way to the back. Let's see, there's a microphone. I can't see. Uh, do you have any comment about Hollywood's uh, version of Juarez, the film Juarez, that was made in 1930 starring Paul Mooney? And uh, how inaccurate or accurate was that? I, I know it wasn't based on primary sources and everything, but the film Juarez uh, starring Paul Mooney. I didn't see it. I haven't Sorry. seen it. Sorry. I haven't seen it. I, I heard about I know mm -hmm. there is, but I, we, we didn't see it for this. Mm -hmm. No, none of us have seen it. Yeah. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? Catalina? <laughs> I'm curious about where the scenes, the, the docudrama scenes are filmed. Are, did you guys go to Mexico to the different places, or uh, did you have a set here? Yeah, I mean, we, we did most of them uh, in the area of close to the EFE, in some of the colonial haciendas. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the desert sequence we went to, which is not too far from Mexico City, also in Hidalgo. And uh, there is a couple seen in the area of Puebla also. I think the Zacatecas one, but they were just around the, the not too far from the EFE. Yes. Is there a question here? Don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, recognizing that Hispanic heritage is not only Mexican heritage, is Discovery planning other um, Latin American countries' films and documentaries and doc dramas? Uh, we would love to. Um, uh, we, we did a few years ago, we did something on Margarita Sainz, the wife of uh, Simon Bolivar. Um, we, yeah, we, we would love to explore more, more characters. Um, we will eventually, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's audience for our yes, <laughs> yes. history. Absolutely. Yes, for um, sure. And there are uh, countless stories and oh. countless character. Definitely. Well, I think this is it. Thank you so much, both of you, Michaela, for the wonderful uh, film and for allowing us to show it here at the Library of Congress. Thank you so much. I am sure we'll have people come and ask for We will actually would like to make a donation to the library of the original script. Of, oh. oh, wonderful. Of the, Fantastic. Of the docudrama. <laughs> <laughs> Give it that to is me. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>